Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. George here. And today what I'd like to bring to you is uh, a quick overview of the paratroop rules in uh, Chapter E, uh, 9, Echo 9. Um, I'm calling this an overview because a full tutorial regarding the, um, the paratroop rules will take an awful lo long time. And then I, I don't want to be uh, telling you that... Uh, this will be complete in itself uh, as a teaching tool uh, because uh, what would rather be a better alternative is to watch this video and then go into chapter 9 and read the, um, read the um, uh, paratroop rules. But in addition to that, there are some other related rules that you need to be aware of to play the paratrooper as well. So I'm going to try and, and point those uh, peripheral rules that are not so peripheral uh, to you as well. So um, I'm going to try and do this by showing you a, a, a gameplay example. And uh, this is a, a make-believe scenario, which was inspired by my knowledge of a Soviet paratroop uh, event that happened during World War II, which I learned about back in my days at McGill. And... Uh, I found it on the internet, Wikipedia. If it's on the net, it has to be true. <laughs> Perhaps not. Now, if, if you do also a search with using uh, Bing, uh, you might get different results. But I found uh, one thing here was the Vyazma Airborne Operation, which took place between the 18th of January and the 28th of February, 1942. Uh, the combatants were the elements of the 4th Panzer Army under Fedor von Bock. Ooh. and Ivan Zatev, Zatev Bakken of the 4th Airborne uh, Corps of the Soviet Union. And basically what they uh, had done was somewhere around the uh, uh, Smolensk uh, Oblast, they, uh, the uh, Soviet paratroops uh, fell behind enemy lines with the intention that the uh, land forces would uh, encircle uh, elements of the 4th Panzer Army or Army Group Center. And eventually what happened was, is the Soviet paratroops uh, held in line for quite some time, uh, but eventually they, uh, they were nearly annihilated and whatever other surviving uh, Russian troops uh, fell back to the 10th Army. At least that's how I understood it. I could be wrong. So that's what inspired this semi-historical scenario. And I just uh, jotted down some notes Red Eagles, Vyazma Airborne Operation, 18th to uh, 28th of February. That's not accurate, but anyway. Takes place in Smolensk uh, Oblast. What's important to note, it's 1942, so there are no Panzerfausts. Not that we have any armor. Um, so we have elements of the 201st Airborne Brigade and 250th uh, Airborne Regiment and versus elements of the German 4th Army. There you go. And this is how I depicted it on Vassal. So we have uh, three German leaders. We have Colonel Lutz, and he's gu guarding the headquarters. Uh, he's in the rear. He has a, a minimal guard. And then we have Steiner, uh, fully on guard in, in the outskirts of the village. And then we have uh, uh, Sergeant Mueller coming back from the front. So this is north, east, south, and and. Uh, west on the other side of the board. Um, so what's going to happen is uh, these uh, Soviet troops will uh, will drop onto three different locations. I, I put here drop on board four, but I uh, decided not to. I'll tell you why in, in, uh, afterwards. Now this scenario hasn't been balanced. It hasn't been play tested. It's just to show you uh, an example of paratroops. So the first thing that you need to establish is whether, as per our uh, advanced sequence of play, uh, which is, uh, where do I have it? Right here, right? Set up off for board reinforcements uh, and uh, wind change and wind direction. Now, in paratroop uh, scenarios, you have to establish wind direction uh, regardless of whether there is wind or not. So let's do that. There's no wind, no gusts. And let's do a, a wind direction 
dice roll, and one is where the direction of the uh, of the um, of the letter coordinate of the hex, or you can use the sniper uh, counter to establish that. So let's do that. And that's five. So wind direction is this way. So let's ro roll that to remind us that it's in that direction, direction five. Okay. And uh, now what you need to do is um, you need to have uh, each wing with five sticks. A stick is represented by a parachute. Okay. Support weapons drop uh, separately unless um, you're British or American. Um, and by that I mean for the British and the Americans, I'm using the ponderous book of player aids here and uh, they have a, a great, um, a great, um, a, you know, condensed version of the rules. So British retain their light machine gun, light armor and radio. U.S. retain light uh, mortar. And the, um, for the Germans altogether, uh, they have to find their canister, their weapons canister. Otherwise, they are uh, considered unarmed. And that rule, I'll give you the rule reference, it's in chapter E, 9 something. It's uh, 9.7, pre-1942 German power drops. So that would include scenarios involving Crete. So uh, it involves um, have it playing with counters that have less firepower factors until such time that the German finds the uh, canister. Now this is a Soviet power drop, it's not a German power drop. And there are certain intricacies attributable only to the Soviet player there as well. So now what you need to establish is uh, your wings and each wing uh, consists of five sticks and only one wing is allowed to have less than five sticks. But in this case, I have uh, three wings of five sticks and um, you're allowed to have a, a leader with a a, a stick is basically a, a, a multi-man counter with a leader and the support weapons drop uh, separately. Um, so they have their own parachute uh, and um, they have to be dismantled if possible. Now the MMG could not be dismantled by Lieutenant Tupitsa so he gave it to uh, Major Vlavinov. But Tupitsa took the dismantled mortar which is an 82 millimeter mortar and five protash points. So that's going to drop separately in their own parachute. And um, so let's establish our wings, wing number one. And I'm going to put a leader with one multi-man counter. Uh, I want a support weapon here, a support weapon there, a support weapon with Mr. Vlavinov. Uh, I'm not too sure I want to, to let the mortar drop with uh, Lieutenant Tupitsa here. So each guy is going to get their own uh, parachute plus the support weapon. Now, um, they're, they're considered cloaked with the parachute counter. And what I mean by that is that they all have a morale of seven, uh, but otherwise they're not considered concealed. And we have to have uh, separate parachutes for, for, the, uh, for the support weapons. There we go. And ideally these would go into your cloaking box if you're playing the board game. So you cannot, once you cover them up, you cannot consult what's underneath the counter until they come into play. Now, the other thing you can do is use my methodology of getting blank counters and putting, uh, let's say you can put this as unit A and then uh, randomizing these little counters and uh, putting them under uh, one of these uh, parachute counters to reveal which unit is actually under there. But I'm not going to do that because uh, I would fi I find it a little bit too tedious and will, I'll take attention away from the rules as opposed to, um, you know, I'll take attention away from the rules uh, and make things a little bit boring. Uh, so pretend that we, we can't, can't consult what's underneath here. And the reason why I have those letter uh, cheats there is because we might have to resolve for for um, for drift, 
And rather than using the Sasso counters, I'm using these counters because you cannot uh, replicate them. These counters being these babies over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover them up with blanks and then uh, uh, randomize them to the best of my ability. I'm going to um, just pause the video on my end uh, for now so I can do that little random randomization. And then I'll be back with uh, um, a follow-up to, to this. So here we have it. I just randomized everything here, but reordered them and everything. And the other thing that we need is small counters to represent the um, uh, parachutes. So we'll get some of those air units. So we got uh, a support weapon there, a support weapon here, another one here, and another one there. So let's just change that letter designation to uh, that. Okay, that's fine. This one would be B. This one would be G. And this one would be N. I'm not too sure if I'm doing this correctly, but uh, because ideally, you should not be able to tell the difference between uh, the support weapon and the actual uh, units. And technically speaking, um, the um, uh, your opponent uh, can conceivably mistakenly uh, support weapon for an actual uh, unit and fire on that instead. Uh, the other thing we need to do is put on our our uh, our uh, sniper. Okay. Now that I got everybody under wings, uh, what I'd like to do is keep these guys underneath the their their cloaking counter there, their parachute cloaking counter, and actually use. Uh, parachutes on on the board so I'm just going to clone everything that I need to clone there just like magic I cloned everything so we established wind direction and it's going that way all right so now we need to establish where our wings are going to fall so wing number one um, yeah we can use um, we can use some blank counters And for unit blank. Okay, so let's say we have wing number one try and fall here. The closer they fall to their objective, the better off they are. And their objective is the Soviet player wins the moment they capture loots or occupy uh, control building N2, the headquarters. There you go, wing number two, and then let's uh, clone this in the uh, wing number two here, one there. And basically, this is one, two, and three. Okay. Let's clone this again and put wing number three. Oh, let's see where we're going to put wing number three. Right on top of Steiner. Well, I really want to do that. Uh, let's put them in the weak field. Soft la belly landing. Three. Uh, wing three. There you go. All fine and dandy. Let's take a look at our... Uh, all right. Pre designate drop point. Per wing distance should be uh, five or more hexes from each drop point. So my drop points have to be at least five hexes away from one another. And here they are, okay. Hey, what happened to wing number two going there? We want it over here. So that we're at least five hexes away from each other. All fine and dandy, okay. And now what we have to do 
is establish if they're accurate or not. Uh, Pre-1942 German uh, power drops are partially armed until they find the arms canister. Uh, each end of moving phase that moves greater than or equal to one hex make a DR less than or equal to one minus one DRM for, per hex moved plus one DRM CX. Okay, well, that's not the case. So we don't worry about that. Here's the rally phase. So now we got to roll for um, to see if each uh, uh, wing will drop where they're supposed to. A one to three uh, is indicates that the drop point is the pre-designated pre-designated area. A uh, four to six, a drop point is uh, by a random selection. Okay, let's go back to our board. Let's make a one d six roll here. Everybody can see my dice rolls here. Let's go do it. Six is not accurate. So in this case, this is where the random selection comes in, and you have to draw a drift counter. Now the actual drift counter. Uh, looks like there's a snow drift, a little thing like a, a, a wave type of thing. And on the upper left-hand corner, there is a letter designated. And on the reverse side, there are boats. So here you can't drip, uh, you can't flip a drift counter. So that's why I created these tokens I can draw from. So this guy is not accurate. Now what happens is you have to do a random selection as to which board uh, they're going to uh, drop. So this is one, this is uh, the color dye, this is the um, the white dye. You can do it uh, using either the 1d6 or the 2d6 with the color dye being here and the white dye being there. So they're going to drop in uh, on board 4 actually. And uh, since they're dropping on board 4 now I need to uh, place the wing on a letter coordinate, and I'm going to pick the letter coordinate from here. I'm going to pick this one. Oh, 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 oh! Reminds me of Archie Bunker. M N O P, and we're going to put him in O five. There you go. O five. That's where they actually going to uh, uh, drop. And then we have to roll for drift using uh, a 2d6, direction and distance, and direction one being in this direction. All right, so let's do a 2d6, direction five, which is that way, and five. Now, for the Russians, you have to add to the um, distance uh, 1.5, 50% more, uh, fractions rounded up. So a half of five is 2.5, fractions rounded up is three. So I, I actually drift eight hexes away from here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I settled for drift, they come here. Now what I do is I put, uh, I start putting the, uh, the wing in the direction of the wind, starting with the middle hex. You put this one on top, middle, and then to the side, yep, on each side, just like so. So that, that's where actually uh, wing number one uh, is uh, uh, going to drop from, <laughs> because now there's more, uh, more uh, moving to be done. Now, wing number two, remember a one, two, three, it lands where it's supposed to. Four, five, six. Hey, they actually do land where they're supposed to. Great. So, wing number two, we got place one in the center. Whoops. Dexterity issues. Come on. H goes on one side, I goes on the other. And we have further drift to do. This boy goes here. And wing number three, let's do uh, 1d6. Inaccurate, so it won't drop in the pre designated hex. Now we're going to determine by random selection which board they do actually fall in. 
uh, they do actually fall in uh, hex number three. But now, notice that I've already used uh, uh, for uh, hex coordinate letter O. Now, if you use the sasual sasual uh, um, counters and and um, vassal, you risk to uh, having the same letter coordinate. Uh, so, uh, I believe in chapter E, they do say that, uh, you know, use one that has not been already used in, in the rule when settling drift. And drift is described actually prior to the power troop rules um, in the snow rules, in the snow rules, yeah. There it is, it's under 3.75. Um, drift placement is, is resolved by randomly drawing a drift counter from the complete pool of remaining unused counters, initially putting it in the hex containing coordinate number 5 of the hex row listed of the remaining. Meaning that once you've drawn a, a chip, don't draw the same one again. So we're going to draw another one, but we are going to be somewhere on hex uh, on board four. Let's see where, what we're going to do. Any, meeny, miny, mo, catch the nickel by the toe. There. And what letter coordinate do we pick? M. That's not bad. M5. So we're going to put M5. Here you go. This is M5. And now we still have to. Um, uh, resolve direction and distance. Bring one number three there, and then add fifty percent more on my uh, distance um, dice roll. So direction and distance two, which is that way, and six actually makes it a nine. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And that is that means that sum will be off board. So let's just uh, put a hex grid there. Now, if I put the uh, overlay on top, it's going to uh, muddle things up. Let's make it bigger. There you go. Ah, good enough. And I believe it was here. Which is a bummer. But what do you expect from a tu pizza? Lutena tu pizza. Not much. There's a lot of pizzas in the Kremlin these days. Kind of reminds me of the song. One potato, two potato more. Three potato, four potato more. Something like that. One tu pizza, two tu pizzas more. There you go. So six plus fifty percent of six, nine. The Germans like the letter, the the, uh, the number nine. So let's see if this we did this accurately here, more or less. Here we go. Rally phase. Each wing, uh, dr one to three drop point pre-designated. Four to, five, uh, to six drop point random selection. Dr per board. For select board, trade, uh, drift placement uh, procedure, 3.75 of drop point, draw drift counter, that's what we did, put it in coordinate number 5 of the hex row, and then random location for the definitive uh, hex, one stick and drop a point, and two sticks each uh, side of hex row, like so. Um, so now we can go to uh, the movement phase. Let's go to the movement phase. Let's go back to a little playing area. And uh, next phase is prep. There is no prep. And now it's movement. And during movement phase, what we have to do is establish uh, drift. Uh, now, I'm not too sure if there, the extension of error also applies to, to this case. Um, 
I think it does because basically the whole point of this is that um, what is happening is the Russians traditionally drop their paratroops from a high altitude. They had no choice because um, they were concerned about AA fire and their airplanes were very vulnerable to AA fire. Some of them were still biplanes and not metal or anything to that effect. Whereas the Germans, they have a lower drift margin of error uh, because they were um, dropped from a lower altitude. So we'll take into consideration that um, margin of error 50% more. And we'll start with K. We'll do a, a don't, let's not forget this is, this is, a, 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 this is the movement phase. So let's do a margin of error here. Two and one. So fractions round up, this guy will land over there. There you go. I, two and f two and two, which makes it a four. Uh, one, two, three, and four. This fellow here, two and, and, and uh, eight. So direction two and eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, lucky dude. And it's uh, the dude on the bottom. So he goes eight to there. This guy here. Let's do it. Uh, drift. One and two. So one, two. This two. One and uh, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Wow. Here. Three, which is this way, and uh, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here. One and uh, and five. Half of, of three is 1.5. Fractions under two. Three plus two is five. We are adding 50% uh, to, uh, to the distance correction. Uh, so one, two, three, three to there four and five they're spread all over the place well now if there was wind at the end of this um, at the end of this uh, uh, procedure you would have to uh, uh, further adjust for wind in the direction of the wind um, so it summed up again in the in this uh, handy dandy um, handy dandy uh, uh, cheat sheet. So adjust for wind drift, as you can see here in the example, once they do the direction and distance, then you adjust accordingly for the wind drift, depending on where the uh, wind is blowing from. For mild gusts, another two hexes, gust three hexes, and heavy winds is four hexes. The other thing that wind has uh, an impact on is if you're, um, if you're, uh, parachute is dropping on a uh, woods, road, forest road, crag, building, shadow, stream, cactus hedge, cactus patch, olive grove, jungle, bamboo, swamp, swamp, integrated uh, rice paddies or marsh hex, you also have to incur a, a morale check and you're adding a uh, normal morale check, a one a morale check if there's no wind it's a normal mild breeze it's a one check and if it's a heavy uh, winds or gust it's a two check um if it fails deploy half squad accompanied move one hex downwind um and you have uh an ntc hmm. we'll go over that again offboard landing reverse per, uh, terrain We'll, we'll try and, and do that as well. All right, 
because we do have an off-board landing. Let's go back to our game. So far, the Germans are, are seeing things dropping from the sky, and they're saying, what the heck is going on? Let's do D. Direction 5 and 4. 1, 2, 3, and 4. Just on the board edge. Here, little b. Direction and distance, 1 and uh, 6. 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, just behind the woods, which is not bad. B itself, 6 and 4. 1, 2, 3, and 4. And little a, 3 and 5, uh, 2 and 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 to L6. Big A. 4 and 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Boom. D. Direction and distance. 2. 2 and uh, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Nice. Echo. Direction and distance. 3 and 2. 1, 2. Now comes to our buddies that are here. So M. Direction and distance. 1 and uh, 3. 1, 2, and 3. Little n, 4 and 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Candy and popcorn is falling from the sky. And big n, 5 and 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Just love counting here. Count Dracula. <laughs> One, two, three. Let's go. Uh, oh, direction and distance. Four and five. Uh, five, nope, eight. Uh, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. V8. Kind of reminds me I need a beverage. <laughs> uh, P as in Papa. Direction and distance. 3 and 9. That's going to be funny. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right next to these guys. All right. Uh, last one. 1 and 2, which is 1, 2. So we have two guys uh, falling off board. And we have to use that reverse procedure. Here, um, we have a, a fellow uh, almost adjacent, and they're really not almost adjacent. They look to be adjacent, but then this is where aerial range comes in, which is also a rule that precedes um, the power drop rules. It's in Echo.5, which stipulates that um, aerial range is two times the uh, number of hexes away. So you're counting by twos. Uh, so this fellow is actually two hexes away. That would be four, six, eight in terms of, uh, of um, counting aerial range. He's not subject to triple point blank fire or point blank fire at this point of the game. But for they would be subject to uh, half hour power, um, half hour power for long range. So here, for example, uh, to there, it would be 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 16, uh, 16, 18, 20 hexes away. Now, it's a good thing that he, uh, uh, this multi man counter with the LMG, is stacked with a, a leader because without a leader they cannot 
fire beyond 16 hexes. But in this case, with an LMG, you can only fire up to 16 hexes away. So this guy is completely out of range from Steiner. Um, the other thing you need to know is that um, paratroops can be seen unless there is an intervening uh, blind hex. So in this case, he cannot see this dude up here, but he can certainly see this fellow here. You could probably see this guy here as well. And whether they are in range or not, um, that's another matter. And this fellow can actually fire uh, only at up to a 16 hex range, not 24. If he was stacked with a leader, he would be, uh, and it would be considered also area fire. So that, uh, what am I talking about, is Alpha 9.4 mandatory fire direction. Okay. There's always a possibility that I'm wrong, and if you correct me, can you respectfully correct me in the comment section? I'll pin your comment if, if your answer is correct, and I'll validate it. So people can have uh, an updated version of everything. Let's zoom out of the board and see what the heck is going on with the Russians. They're all over the place. So I started with three neat wings. I got a couple of units off board. And everywhere else, they're scattered. Now, how can these guys mount a coherent um, defense against the um, Germans? Well, if they go berserk and they acquire a morale of 10, you know, the, the Germans are fried. And, and the other question that arises is, how do these guys fit into the picture? And, and um, as passengers, can they fire out of the truck and, and, and hit the fire troops? Um, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll look into that. So we got a couple of things that you need to know um, uh, that uh, is uh, important. Uh, just up to this point at all, uh, at all there's three r rules that you, you need to be familiar with before you actually get to the paratroop rules, which is E9. There is drift <coughs> covered under E3.75. You need to understand how it works. Then you need to know, uh, even before that, A9.4, which is mandatory fire direction. So you have your LMGs uh, in the right order. Um, and I'll tell you why in a second why uh, the LMGs are important. And uh, E.5, aerial range, and how to calculate it. E.5 which is right at the beginning of the book. Now, why am I stressing the importance of LMGs here? Is because, as you can see, let's say, look at this fire group here. We have a mortar, we have an LMG, and we have some multi-man counters. Now, what's important to note here is that you're saying, hey, look, these guys are going to get slaughtered. And um, more often than not, paratroop landings are really a horrendous event in terms of casualties. Um, but here... If you take a look at the rules for paratroops, there's only a certain type of, of, of um, weapons and, and uh, infantry that can fire at them um, by design. Eligible fires and snipers, E9.32, only small arms and light AA weapons can fire uh, defensive first fire, subsequent first fire versus aerial targets. Um, there's no to hit the arm. Sniper attack and fire lane is allowed, uh, is not, no f two hit DR, sniper attack or fire lane is allowed versus aerial targets. Para troop glider snipers may not attack until the game turn their side starts with infantry on board. So at this stage of the game, um, all these para troops, regardless of, of the fact that some of them are six to eights, have a morale of seven. The leaders, can act, act as leaders until they lose their power troop, uh, their power, uh, parachute. And in addition to that, power troops are not subject to normal rug principles. That's all in the chapter. Uh, now, at this stage of the game, we can attack the power troops. And they're subject, the power troops are subject to hazardous movement. So they get A minus 2 DRM. So um, let's consider this being the movement phase. Um, so we have uh, first fire and defensive first fire, uh, first fire and final fire. Um, and let's take a look at that. 
Um, all right, so we've got here uh, four hex range. So they're in, uh, in uh, range. I would consider this uh, power troop to be blind to him because it, there is a blind hex here. So you can't, I don't think he can fire there, right? Um, so boink, I would be a, a six down four. Let's roll that. So two on the six is something really uh, atrocious. Give me a second so I can pull out the IFT table. So here's two on the six is a 1K IA, which is bad. Let's go back here. What's underneath uh, C? C is a six to eight. So this fellow goes to the casualty bin, uh, allied casualty bin. And we can, for all intents and purposes, we can take them off board. And they first fired. Uh, mortar can't fire, uh, but the squad can fire with his inherent firepower. Uh, this would be two, four, six, eight. Um, so that's outside of my loss, outside of my range, uh, eight. So it'd be two down two. That's a good shot. Let's do a two down two. Uh, that's nothing. And he first fired. Um, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Um, two, four, six, eight, ten. We'll fire here to there, two down two. Five on the two table. Five, it's a normal. So don't forget their morale is seven. They make it, he first fired. Now let's take a look at the passengers for our intents and purposes. So passengers, according to Delta 6.1, can fire with their firepower half for mounted fire excluding armored half tracks and they're not in motion so they're not quartered so they can fire but at half firepower so these guys are actually uh counter papa is actually two hexes away from these guys and they got uh eight firepower uh, eight nine ten eleven with the uh, lmg we can use the lmg for rate um at one firepower yeah so uh, halved would be the four table down two. So they rolled a, a, f uh, yeah, they rolled a, a five on the two table, which is a normal. So morale check seven. They passed and they first fired. Hey, they got raid, so one down two. Nope, they coward, so they final fired. And uh, Mueller, uh, he has a six. It will be two down th three there. So we rolled a five and down three. We got a two on the... Um, on the six table, two on the six table, something really bad. Another K1, and Arshu Papa just went away. And he first fired as well. This is a 447, so he's really out of range. Uh, the MMG here, 2, 4, 6, 8. The MMG, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. A 4 down 2. We can eliminate the wing 2 counter. 4 down 2. 1 on the 4. That's really bad. And rate. One on the four. 
So I'm KIA. So that guy is gone as well. Allied Tezrubin. We got Rate. Oh, I guess you guys get the picture. Wow. So it, it's not that bad that they some units have uh, uh, just shifted away from this stuff. Now, the moment um, defensive fire is over, right? I believe what happens next is they can shift one hex. Including the ones off board. Let me double check that, okay? So let's remove our moves. So here it is. Uh, Echo 9.4 landing. After all defensive subsequent fire versus aerial para uh, paratroops has ended. Unbroken aerial paratroops, not separate support weapons, may move one hex in any direction, excluding Germans. All parachutes then land at the base level of their current hex, at which point five eighth parachutes have become known enemy have become known enemy units. Excluding if that hex contains a bridge, not a footbridge, it lands on the bridge and a DR of one or two DR one if a one lane bridge, otherwise it lands in the hex where uh, there is a minus one DRM to this DR if the unit is unbroken. For interior building hexes C nine point four two. Unit support weapon landings in a blaze, non frozen water obstacle, or deep flooded stream are eliminated. All half inch parachutes are then flipped over. Thereafter, neither player may check the identity of that parachute until it has been recovered. I believe it's recovered later on. Okay, and then we're going to check off board landing. All right, let's uh, move in one hex in any direction. Obviously, I want to move these guys off board here, if I could, and move some folks closer to their objective. Now, the uh, I can't move the um, I can't move the um, the support weapons. This guy would otherwise land on a on a on in, in a uh, woods, and I don't want to do that because it would uh, necessitate a norm a NTC. I'm going to move this guy behind it. the woods, move this guy closer, move this guy closer, move this unit closer. I can take this thing off. Oh, here. Let's move here. So basically now, from my understanding is, uh, this guy didn't move. Oh, let's move him here. My understanding is, is they are at the base level and they're recovering their parachutes, right? Now we got to settle how these guys uh, come about. So let's take a, a quick look at at uh, offboard landings and the reverse um, terrain uh, procedure. Just give me a sec. So offboard landings are actually covered in Echo Eight Two Two One. And there is an example here of a glider 1LH is 4P10 with an avenue of approach. So 4P10, 4 Papa 10 would be here. Let's use one of these uh, markers to designate 4P10. And assume that there isn't any uh, other uh, terrain uh, uh, butted to this board. 4P10, with an avenue approach hypothetical, K13 to all, K13 A13, I see. Let's use these babies. K13, 11, 12, 13, 2, 
Oh, 11. Like so. Okay. The terrain in the preceding five hexes of the offboard av avenue of approach is equivalent to U8. MNOP QRST U8. Okay. T8 S9 R9 and Q10. Now the beauty about these is you can uh, what you can do is you can put in here U8. S9 and R9. So this was this thing here is what we got here is woods. Here and clear and clear and here. Okay. If the glider were to land now, it would be subject to a minus 3 DRM to the color DR, negative 4 uh, for 4 consecutive uh, hexes in the avenue of approach clear. There's 1, 2, 3, 4 clear. Uh, at the base level, plus 1 level obstacle, use 8, which is the woods. Now assume that the glider is forced to take evasive action, rolls a 6. Four and a uh, color die, resulting in a change of two hexes in the direction, direction four, which is down this way, uh, to the hypothetical offboard hex P12, all right, which is uh, P12 would be uh, 11, 12, down to here. Is equivalent to the terrain in P8 of its avenue approach is equivalent to terrain U6. U6. P8. There's a U6. U6, U6, T6, well the bell I just rang was my sister and I had a little epiphany. I got the example a little bit uh, right. So they, they moved the, the wing due to a correction to hypothetical uh, hex P12 which is two hexes away from the last hex on this board. And now they're saying, all right, that the equivalent is P8 going in this direction. So then you have uh, woods here, clear, 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 and clear. Yeah. So it would be uh, U6, right, T6, S7, R7, and Q8. So uh, for the purposes of glider modifiers, which is a different thing, it comes out, nets out to zero. But what's important to note is, is that that wing was corrected hypothetically two hexes away, uh, and the 
mirror image of that is is considered the terrain hex, the initial hex. So I would say that uh, here we're in woods. Uh, so this guy was going to have to take an empty scene, and here uh, it's one two hexes away. So one two hexes away, uh, and there's let's see, one two three. So this guy would probably be in grain, based on what I see here. Uh, I I'm just taking the, um, I'm taking the, uh, the mirror image, just like they used the example here. P uh, P12 is is the equivalent to uh, P8, All right? So this guy is landing in woods. Hold on. Uh, there we go. And this guy's landing in grain for all intents and purposes. If he's landing in woods, he's going to have to take an NTC. Uh, let's say we don't have any uh, defensive fire, advancing fire, and, and route. Um, in this case, um, what's happening is that under E9, paratroopers. Advancing, advancing fire and route the player turn, and this is 9.5. In the player turn, they land. Paratroops may not attack or route, and are not subject to route rules, including surrender failure to route 9.5. Uh, and we are not allowed advancing. Now, at this point, I think that we are considering uh, landing. We did move one hex anywhere we wanted. We did consider that. Uh, stick M is landing in woods and stick Q is landing in gray. Now, I could be wrong about that, but hey, I'm doing the best I can. Um, so that's for offboard landing. So a 5 8 parachute landing in woods, forest road, crags, shallow stream, cactus, uh, patch, olive grove, jungle, bamboo swamp, irrigated rice paddies, and Marsh must take an immediate NTC using a seven morale level of their parachute. A half inch parachute must also take an immediate N N M N M NMC using a morale of seven, unless there's wind, and when it lands in dense jungle or swamp or Panges. One landing in, the, one landing in an interior building Hex takes an NMC, then moves one hex down to another building hex where it takes another NMC, and so on until its contents are either eliminated or reach a non-interior building hex at the base level at which it lands. All five eighth parachutes must also take an NTC uh, using its seven morale, even if broken. A stick that fails an NTC subsequently deploys in its component half squads. Okay. One half squad, perhaps any accompanying SMC determined by random selection if necessary, it, it, it is moved uh, and to the next hex directly downwind, uh, but need not take any further uh, landing MC NTC, although it is it is eliminative placed in a blaze, non-frozen uh, stream. So let's take that uh, uh, NTC. Actually, uh, MC. Roll the six, he's good. Um, so he's going to land where he lands. So offboard units can advance in the advance phase only to enter the live board. Broken units may rally normally but may not move right until rallied. Offboard support weapons, guns may be recovered normally but only by units that land off board. So now, uh, the units that are, are off board, if I understand rule 9.41 correctly, can only advance until they end up uh, close to the board. So the further away you are from um, the board, uh, the worse that you get. So here we go. Advanced phase, close combat. Let's take a look at the essential advanced sequence of play. I don't think it has parachutes, but... Uh, does it? And this a little document. 
don't see paratroops anywhere. Maybe I'm blind. So basically at this stage of the game, let's check one more resource, the Ponder's Book of ASL. Landing, paratroops may move one hex. Yep, that we did. Uh, off board, reverse, one hex, advanced phase, only to enter the board. Support weapons may be recovered off board. Uh, paras, only by off board. Uh, and it's advancing phase, no route, advanced phase, place support on board paratroops. Uh, no move if not already deployed. Okay, so in the advanced phase, we can put on our power troop. So uh, let's put M. Look who landed off uh, off board. To pizza and his squad. Uh, a little bit mad at this dude. To pizza lands off board, so he's going to be out of out of play for at least uh, uh, the first player turn. Q. There's a 447. We forgive him. We'll put Q there. Whoa, 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 come on. There it goes, Q. Let's get rid of these example markers. A bit convoluted, but I think we get the gist of it. Like I said, if I made any mistakes, just comment below, and um, well, we all learn, live and learn. The worst thing is, is not uh, not playing and not learning. And if anybody tells you you need to learn this before, tell them to um, tell them something creative. Yeah, tell them something creative. Call them a, a son of a mother duck or something like that, and um, it is what it is. Let's put J since we can see J readily. Let's put J here. And uh, we have A. Big A is the leader. Loop off and the six to eight. I think he was there. Uh, if we do a. Okay. He was in Z, uh, Z uh, six. There you go. Let's put this guy here. D as in Donald is down there. Most of our troops had soft landings. That's that's pretty good. Uh, G. We have a medium machine gun flying off to the <laughs> off a hill. What happened to little A? Oh, little A! Look, look where he drifted off. Okay. A B as in Bravo. Let's put him up here, closer to the board. So we got the support weapon and one hex. All the way up there, and Bravo there. Fascinating. I uh, see we've already done Echo. Echo is really uh, in a good position to grab a, an MG. There we go, and. Jizz and George, where did G go? Huh, look at that. Up there. Oh, he's with the leader. That's fine. We have uh, N. There goes to pizza's mortar. And four. 
I'm calling this a mess. But anywho. Look how things uh, started and look how things uh, ended. Let's uh, make it a little bit smaller. Oh, I got I right there. And I got O. It looks like everybody's on board. So after all is said and done, look how scattered these Soviets are. We got two units off board. Uh, everybody else uh, is in a very precarious situation. But mind you, you know this guy in, during the next phase may be able to advance there and have six exert six firepower factors uh, there. Uh, with six up two, it's not a bad shot. Uh, these guys can move through the grain and try and approach these guys, uh, this fellow here to try and take him out. Um, who needs a Russian support weapon when you can capture a nice, bright, bright shiny German ones? Um, this fellow can uh, fire on the IFT table to try and eliminate the, the, the trucks. This squad here too can do the same. So these guys have something to think about before advancing into there. Uh, these guys can stay where they are or they can try and mount the defense. Um, this fellow here can go double time, one, two, three, four, five, six, and reach the leader. And then he'll, he will have uh, 12 firepower factors to attack with. Uh, let's go back and zoom in. This fellow too, is he's out of range of most Germans, and he can go one, two, three, four, five, and bypass six, and he can come close to, to the, this fellow here. Uh, this guy can also uh, by use bypass movement to reach the leader, so he can go one, two and bypass three, four and bypass five, six right there. So that's interesting. It's it's it, he they're scattered, but it was to their advantage to scatter in the first place, and at least one unit or will take at least two turns to come back on board. Um, I allotted seven. Uh, six and a half turns for the Russian player to achieve uh, his objective. I'm beginning to think like with the mechanics of, of Russian power drops, they would probably need eight turns to make a difference. Um, I have the sense that it might be a bound scenario. Nothing definitive yet. Got to play with it a little bit. Perhaps uh, try it out with uh, a couple of friends here and there. You know, see how it works. Yep, so that's it. Uh, that's my little tutorial for power drops. Tutorial slash playthrough slash um, an overview type of thing. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was interesting. You know, uh, we explored a couple of tr uh, rules that are related uh, and found in other sections of the rule book. Um, I may have gotten a few things wrong, but hey, look. Um, if you don't play, you cannot get perfect. You cannot strive for perfection. That's the bottom line. Um, with that said, I'm not sure if I've also showed you, showed you my little glider here. I have a little... It uh, flies pretty well. And, and what this is, is uh, that's a glue. This is uh, to correct the, the wing, because you got to really get the dihero uh, really fine. And uh, as you can see here, I have a little uh, ME... 110 insignia on it, um, handmade decal, I suppose. It flies pretty well. Her point, and I got a shout out to my sister for thanking, thanking her and waking me up when I got the reverse, reverse terrain uh, confusion going on there. So with that said, I'd like to bid you all a, a great day. A great week ahead, a great month, a great year ahead. I know we're going through difficult times, but um, keep a, a stiff upper lip where um, your spirit's high. Low, roll low, and you're low. Jeez, uh, I get so confused sometimes. And um, keep on playing. Playing is the key to, to success. 
Have a great one, and uh, thank you all to all the subscribers, new and old. George, over and out.